Well, and now we switch to the second great class of methods, the differential equation methods based on discretizing differential equations like the Maxwell's equations or the wave equations, in contrast with integral equation methods that discretize the electric, magnetic or combined field integral equations. To introduce differential equation methods or finite difference methods, I just remind you one of the slides in at the beginning of chapter three, in which we, we were dis discussing the division between integral equation and differential equation methods, and we said that differential equation methods were based on the discretization of the the derivatives with uh, finite differences. We will dedicate next slide to this discretization and it is applied either to Maxwell equation or to wave equation. The, it is important to observe that we need a three-dimensional mesh, a three-dimensional discretization because the differential equations are defined in the whole volume of the inside the object in, or, and also around the object in contrast with the integral equations derived from surface equivalence that are defined only on the surface of a homogeneous region. Here the differential equations are defined everywhere in the whole volume, so we need a volume discretization. Uh, we will dedicate a slide later to discuss the issue that we have to terminate the mesh and this is uh, the, that we have to set a truncation boundary condition. We will discuss about this later. We, has, we have also said that these methods lead to a sparse matrix. In, next, in a few slides we will, say, we will see an example and of course they can model in homogeneous media because since the Maxwell or wave equations are defined for the whole volume, we can change the constitutive parameters, we can change the epsilon and mu uh, per electric permittivity or magnetic permeability of the medium. We can change them from one point to the other or in the case of the wave equation we can change the propagation constant that is the uh, that is omega square root uh, mu epsilon we can change it also from one point to the other so we can model in homogeneous media just setting at each point or for each discretization cell or discreti or discretization a small volume we can set the corresponding value of permittivity and magnetic permeability um, in, in for each of them Examples, very important examples of this class of methods are finite difference time domain, that is a time domain method based on this discretization of the derivatives in finite differences applied to the Maxwell's equations. We will dedicate some slides to this method. And also the finite element method is very convenient because it discretizes the wave equation or normally the wave equation using some uh, elements like in this picture some discretization elements that doesn't don't need to be uh, square parallelepipeda parallelepipeds or cubes they can have any shape and even have curved uh, boundaries and it is much better than the straightforward discretization of the derivative like this with finite differences because this straightforward discretization leads to a sampling in a uniform mesh like it is like in this picture and this sampling in a uniform mesh doesn't allow the the good a good representation of boundaries that are not planar so for to to model uh, complex are objects with curves uh, surfaces like for example in this case the human head it is much better to use the finite element method we will dedicate a few slides to finite element methods but first we will discuss 
the straightforward discretization using this uh, finite difference approximation, which is called the finite difference method, uh, in this case in frequency domain, just to introduce the, um, this family of, of methods. And about this finite difference approximation, it's well known, you have probably seen it in your courses on mathematics. We can, in fact, it is, in fact, it is the, the, the definition of derivative. The derivative of a function at point x0 is the difference between the value of the function just at the right of x0 minus the value just at the left divided by the separation between the two samples when the sorry when the separation goes to zero okay so this is it is just the definition of derivative in this case we just sample the function and and, and subtract we very often have a x space sampling and in this case to obtain the derivative at point xi, we subtract the value of the function at the next point on the right, so to obtain the value at xi here, we subtract x, the value at, of the function at xi plus 1, minus the value of the function at xi minus 1, and divide by the separation between the two samples that we are subtracting, that is twice the sampling step. And this is a central difference scheme because it gives the derivative at, at the center of the points that we are subtracting. To obtain the derivative here, we subtract one point at the right minus one point at the left. And this is a good approximation of the derivative because the derivative is the tangent to the function and it's more or less approximated with the slope of this straight segment that goes from the sample at the right to the sample at the left or, by, or vice versa. However, sometimes people approximate the derivative subtracting the sample at the right minus the sample at the point where we want to compute the derivative. In this case, the value that we obtain in the approximation is the slope of that straight segment that is not the same, is not the same, is not a good approximation as the, to the, it's not a good, good approximation to the slope of the derivative. The same happens if we subtract the value of the function at the point where we want to compute the derivative minus the value of the function at the point at the left. In this case, we obtain the approximation is the slope of this segment in green. That is also not a good enough approximation to the true derivative at the, at the center, at the point. So, the best approximation and the one that we have to use is always subtract one point at the right, so the sample at x i plus one at, at i plus one minus the sample at the left, which is the sample i minus one, and this allows us to obtain the derivative at sample i. Okay, here, this is the central differences scheme. And it's the one that produces the less error and the one that we have to use always. We can apply this to the to the second derivative. The second derivative is in fact the derivative of the derivative. So in the, in the, to compute the second derivative at this point, at the center point, we have to subtract the value of the first derivative here min, min, minus the value of the first derivative here 
to have a, a central difference scheme. So we subtract the first derivative here minus the sub minus the first derivative here. And what is the first derivative? The first derivative here is this sample minus this one. And the first derivative here is this sample minus this one. So when we apply this all together, we obtain this discretization for the second derivative. This is the second derivative. In the case of the wave equation, we have to sum k squared the function and we obtain this wave equation in finite differences. So this is our discrete approximation to the wave equation and the one that we can program in a computer. Well, we have a uniform sampling, so we set the sampling step delta x equal to h, which because it's sh sh shorter, and then our approximation to the wave equation becomes this, that is the last equation in the previous slide, replacing delta x by h. And now we have to set some boundary conditions. Remember that to solve a differential equation, we need some boundary conditions, and a very typical boundary condition, in the, if, if, the, if, if it is the wave equation for the potential, we can set the potential at a certain point equal to a value B0. Or if it is, for example, the boundary condition, at, in fact, this would be a, a generator excitation. It is, we are in harmonic regime, so in this case, setting a potential like this means that, for example, if this is a one-dimensional, this is a one-dimensional wave equation. One-dimensional wave equation is the, for example, the problem that we have in a transmission line, okay? In a transmission line. Then in a transmission line, we can set the potential at a certain point using a generator the potential at a certain point equal to B0. Remember that in, in harmonic regime, everything is has harmonic time variation, and this B0 is just a phasor that shows the amplitude and the phase of the oscillator or of the oscillation of this generator. So we can set B0 for the potential here, and then the unknown in our uh, wave equation would be the potential as a function of set coordinate, okay? And if we have uh, the wave equation for the electric field or the magnetic field, uh, we can also set other boundary conditions. For example, for a perfect electric condition conductor, the electric field is equal to zero. So we set uh, one of these at some point, we set the field equal to zero, for example, at the last sample at n, or in the perfect magnetic conductor, we have the magnetic field equal to zero. And if our equation is equation for the electric field, in one dimension, the magnetic field is the derivative of the electric field. And the derivative of the electric field equal to zero means that the last two samples of the electric field are equal to have a, a zero derivative. And in this case, we have a, a third possible uh, boundary condition. So the typical boundary conditions are just setting the value of the unknown, that is the potential or the field, or boundary conditions for, for perfect electric conductor or perfect magnetic conductor. With any of these conditions, we we'll eliminate some of the unknowns. Here, in the discretization of the wave equation, we have unknowns. The unknowns are the values of F at all the points. F can be potential, electric field, magnetic field normally, potential or electric field normally, usually. And the boundary condition sets the value of these unknowns at some points, but of course, the value under remaining points is still unknowns, 
and are the elements of this vector are the unknown values of our unknown potential or, or electric field at some points. But at the other points where we have set a boundary condition, we know the value. And then the, for the points where we know the value, imagine for example here for the first point, we know the value here for the first point. If it, if it is known, this goes to the right hand side. And for example, in the case that we know that the value of the function at the first point is equal to F0, this, which is the value at the first point, goes to the right hand side and we get this term in the right hand side. We, we, the h square comes from the fact that here we multiply everything by h square, so the value that we get at the right hand side is multiplied by h square. And what else? The, the remaining uh, unknowns go to the to the unknown vector. The matrix here, the matrix includes the coefficients of the unknowns. For example, for a given point, let's see what happens. For a given point, we have the value of that point times k square times h square because I said that we multiply everything by h uh, square. So uh, here we have h square k square times the unknown value because you multiply rows by columns. So the first term goes multiplied by this value. So h square k square, remember we multiply everything by h square, so h square k square, the unknown value here, but also the unknown value is multiplied by minus 2 here, so minus 2. Then we also have to add the, and the same uh, here and here and here, the same everywhere in the diagonal. Then we have to sum the value of the function at the right, at the next sampling point, this one here. This one here is multiplied by the next value, or this by this, this one is multiplied by the next value of the unknown, so it's this summation here. But we also have to sum the value at the left. The value of the left is this one here, or here for the next point, etc. So essentially, what we get in this one-dimensional case, of course, in two or three dimensions, it becomes uh, much more complicated, but in just one dimension, we get a matrix that has a, a diagonal equal to k square h square minus 2 for this, and then two side diagonals equal to 1. And the, it's, this matrix is multiplied by the vector of unknowns, which makes multiplying the matrix by the vector of unknowns makes this uh, operation here. And then, uh, sorry, with this, with the k. And at the right hand side, we have in, initially zeros, but the boundary condition has set value to some of the unknown samples and the known samples that become known due to the boundary condition go to the right and appear here. By the way, I think that this h square is wrong. I think that this h square is wrong, so I will... This h square is wrong because we multiply everything by h square and this f is no, has no coefficient and goes to the right with minus sign but without no coefficient. So this h square is wrong I, and I will remove it from the class node. And there is an important issue that we will discuss later but we but it's now we have a good opportunity to introduce it now because we have the equation, the discretization and everything here. 
the finding difference equation for the second derivative relates the value of the sample, uh, the value of the, of the function at a certain sample xi with the value at xi plus 1 that is to the right and the value at i minus 1, xi minus 1, that is the sample at the left. So, unless we have a boundary condition, we always need a sample at the right and a sample at the left. Normally, we don't have boundary conditions on both sides, for example. We can have a boundary condition uh, here, let's say a perfect, uh, a boundary condition of a perfect electric conductor that says that the uh, field here is equal to zero, okay, but uh, we don't have a boundary condition at the right because if we had one, it would be a resonant cavity and it is not the case normally. So, to the right hand side, what we have is propagation. We have a wave that propagates with no terminating, uh, with no termination, with no uh, perfect electric or magnetic uh, conductor. So, according to this uh, finite difference equation, we always have to assume for every, uh, for the second derivative at every sample, we always have to assume the sample to the right. For that reason, in all the rows, we have a one just at the right of the diagonal corresponding to the next sample to the right that is uh, assumed to obtain the second derivative at a certain point, okay? But this goes to infinity for, because for every point we need the next, and for this we need the next, and for this we need, we need the next, etc. We need to go to infinity. So our uh, matrix would be infinity. We would need uh, infinite rows and infinite columns, and of course this is impossible to implement in the computer. So we have to find a way to terminate the discretization, a way to terminate the discretization at the last sample, imagine that the last sample is n, so we need to set some kind of condition here that terminates the, the sampling without setting the next uh, samples to zero. Because if we just uh, terminate Mm, for example, at xn, this means that xn plus 1 is equal to 0, and the next to, uh, also the next to the right. And if, and, and if, um, and if we set to 0 the, uh, the field at xn plus 1, what we are doing is setting a perfect electric conductor boundary condition. And this is not what we want. We want to allow the waves to travel to the right up to infinity. So we have to set some kind of termination condition that allows the waves to go through that uh, termination condition. So it cannot be a perfect electric conductor or a normal uh, boundary condition. It is called a truncation boundary condition and we will dedicate uh, a slide to this issue later. And now in two or three dimensions. Of course, the picture is for two dimensions because it's the one that is the, that is clear. In three dimensions, you can extrapolate and imagine what uh, would be this like in three dimensions. Then you have the this is the Laplacian in two dimensions, and then you have the Laplacian of the unknown plus k squared the unknown equal to zero in a source-free region. So, the Laplacian is the summation of the second derivative in x direction plus the second derivative in y direction. So you have the second derivative in x direction here, where you subtract the sample, this is x axis and y axis, so you subtract the sample at the right in the x direction minus the sample at the left in x direction also to obtain the second derivative at the center point minus twice the sample at the center point because it's a second derivative and you do the same thing in y direction the second derivative in y direction 
is the subtraction of the next uh, sample in y, which is uh, the uh, top, minus the previous sample in y direction, which is at the bottom, sorry, plus and uh, minus twice the sample at the center, okay? This is in in y direction. And then, of course, you we add k squared uh, the unknown. So this is the what you have to discretize. Of course, now in the linear system that you get, the linear system that you get, you have here the unknowns are uh, all R F I X E Y J. So this uh, includes all this uh, vector of unknowns includes the unknown at all the points. You can store uh, the vector by rows or by columns, it's, it's up to you. But you have to include here in the unknown vector all the uh, two-dimensional unknowns or in the case of three-dimensional, all the unknowns in three dimensions. All the samples in two dimensions or three dimensions. And all of them are by uh, stored by rows or by columns, doesn't matter, but they are all of them in the unknowns in the unknowns vector and here in the matrix you get the uh, coefficients that relate the unknowns in the previous case for one dimension it was clearly uh, a matrix with uh, three diagonals one the main diagonal for the uh, coefficients uh, that include the same sample as, as we have here the unknown and a diagonal at the right for for this and, and a, a, a diagonal at the left for the others. Okay, now everything will be uh, there will be the different uh, will be the, the coefficients, the non zero coefficients will be a spare uh, in the whole matrices because in the whole matrix because you have here relations between samples that are, are different rows or different columns so they are far away from each other in the unknowns vector so you get uh, relations between samples that can be far away in the in the matrix okay so this is now the the linear system matrix is not a three diagonal matrix it has the non-zero elements as part uh, within the matrix anyway it has many zeros the same as as here here, for one dimension, clearly we have only three diagonals different than zero in one dimension, and all the rest, all the rest is zero. Out, outside this band, and here, of course, you have also element different. Well, it depends. No, no, not not if it is not circular. Anyway, you have three diagonals different than zero in one dimension, so it's a band matrix, or band diagonal matrix, and zeros everywhere else. In two dimensions, you or in three dimensions, you also have many zeros, but the elements different than zero are sparse, uh, are distributed randomly uh, within the matrix and not not on 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 three diagonals. Anyway, the important thing also is that you need a regular sampling, and with a regular sampling, there is a small problem. The problem is that when you set the values of the constitutive parameters, for example, imagine that you, your object is a cylinder. I say a cylinder because in two dimensions, objects are assumed to be infinite in set coordinate. So in, two di in a two-dimensional problem, all the objects are infinite in set direction, so we only have variation in xy plane and all the unknowns, the fields and the potentials, etc., all the unknowns depend only on x and y. They are independent on set coordinate. So you solve the problem in the plane, in the xy plane, and for that reason, in the xy plane, we have a circle, but it is a two-dimensional cut of the 3D object, which is a cylinder. For that reason, I say a cylinder here, we have a cylinder, of course, it is the cross 
section of the cylinder in the xy plane, which is a circle, and we set the constitutive parameter so it has a certain epsilon, and outside in a space we have epsilon zero in free space, or vacuum, and so we set the uh, epsilon of the object at the at the sampling points that are within the object and we set the epsilon of vacuum let's use for example blue color we set the epsilon of vacuum in blue color at points that are outside the object but observe that this is in fact your model is now not a, a, in two dimensions not a circle but you get this you get some object with a staircase boundary. Okay? In red color, the epsilon of the object, and in blue color, the epsilon of vacuum. So you can observe that what you get, in fact, is a staircase boundary, which is not uh, correct because it is just a rough approximation of the actual uh, boundary that you, uh, that you really have. So, this is a, a problem. Let's do some tests. This is a, a patch antenna and we, a microstrip antenna. We model it uh, with finite differences. We have the staircase uh, discretization that I told you before. These are samples of the, of the patch and these are samples of free space, of vacuum, okay, or air. So we get this staircase uh, boundary. We get this staircase boundary here, which is just a bad approximation of the real boundary. For that reason, if we compare with a very fine discretization that has a good approximation of the boundary, now with, that, with a very fine approximation, the boundary is quite good, um, the model of the boundary is quite good, and we, with the fine model, we obtain this. With the fine model, we, the, we obtain this, which is this. This is what we obtain here with the fine model. However, with the, with the coarse model, the, the, with the um, coarse uh, discretization, we get something different. At the beginning, for low frequency, it is more or less the same, but for higher frequency, it starts to be different. Why for low frequency it works? Because for low frequency, the inaccuracy with the inaccuracy is the size of the, of the steps, the delta y that we call x, and the delta here, the delta x that we that we call h sorry we call the sampling step delta x or delta y we is called uh, h so this uh, here in this uh, area for in this range sorry in this interval for low frequency the sampling step is much smaller than lambda so if the inaccuracy in the modeling is much smaller than lambda it's irrelevant and it doesn't uh, degenerate the result. The, the computation is good. However, if the here in this area, the sampling step corresponding to the inaccuracy in the modeling of the boundary is comparable to lambda or larger than lambda, then uh, there will be an important error, as we can see that we have up to 5 dB error. So uh, it's a problem. So that means that we must uh, discretize with a sampling step that is much smaller than, than lambda. Anyway, anyway uh, we cannot use the fine sampling always because it needs too many unknowns. You know, you know that if it is the size, if the size is L, the number of unknowns is L, uh, sorry, this is L, 
the number of unknowns is L over the sampling step in x direction Lx, let's say, and Ly times the size in y direction over the sampling step in y direction okay, this is the number of uh, unknowns the number of unknowns and it is a problem because if the sampling step is very small the number of unknowns goes easily to millions and this is a problem so for that reason we need a better approximation of the boundary something that we can do is just a hybrid approximation in which we uh, have uh, uh, larger steps in areas of the of, of the patch where the current is smaller so in this area we have a small current and we have a larger uh, step size a larger error in the modeling of the boundary and here we have the feeding point so here the current is stronger and we have a smaller a smaller step and more accurate modeling in this case the result is better it is probably this one it is this one the result is better and we save uh, unknowns we have less unknowns compared with the uh, fine mesh everywhere but anyway this is a real problem and this is the reason why the uh, finite element method sorry sorry this is the reason why the finite difference method with uniform mesh discretization is rarely used very uh, it's not common only is normally what people do to have a good approximation of the boundary is to use the finite element method that will be the topic of the next video so this the the finite difference method is pedagogic and educational because allows you to understand uh, the finite difference methods but uh, at, but in practice what you need is a very good modeling of the boundary and for that reason you use the finite element method instead that is that as i said before the topic of the next video and now regarding the truncation boundary condition well i, I already said uh, previously in another slide when we were studying the one dimensional discretization that the problem is that uh, according to the uh, finite difference approximation of the second derivative and adding k squared and known the, the approximation to the to the wave equation <coughs> we have uh, to include in the relation always the next sample in order to compute the second derivative here we have to use the four uh, neighbor samples samples and to compute it uh, here we need the neighbor samples and unfortunately to compute the derivative here we need the four neighbor samples and we always need one sample more and we must uh, we need a way to finish or to truncate the mesh i said i told you before that it is not used setting the last sample equal to zero or even equal to the to the previous one because then what you are doing is setting a perfect electric conductor or perfect magnetic conductor boundary condition and then what you produce is to have a, a closed box uh, a res uh, where the waves are reflected and you have a resonant cavity etc and this is not the problem that you want to analyze for example imagine that you have an antenna here and the antenna radiates some waves and what you want to do is to compute the radiation of waves and you have to set a truncation boundary condition that can be uh, trans that allows the, the the outgoing waves to pass through the truncation boundary condition without any reflection it is important the concept without any reflection is important because what you do when you set the last sample equal to zero is to put a perfect electric conductor boundary condition that produces a complete uh, reflection so 
but the idea that what you have in mind is to allow the outgoing waves to exit the discretized volume through the, the, the truncation of the boundary, through the truncation, without any reflection. And there is a way to do that. The way is to use a different, dif another differential equation in the truncation that has the same solution, but only needs samples within the volume, that doesn't need a sample outside the volume. So, of course, this new boundary, this new differential equation must be restricted because the, the differential equation that allows, that is valid for any kind of wave is the wave equation, but it needs, uh, it has a second derivative and needs uh, samples outside. So we have to find a differential equation with uh, a first derivative that doesn't need samples outside, but is valid for our outgoing waves. In one dimension, if we have a one-dimensional problem in x-axis, we can imagine that what we want is to imagine that we want to truncate the boundary. Sorry, this is the last sample. This is sample n. So we want to truncate the boundary at sample n. This is n minus 1. This is sample 1. And this is sample is uh, lowercase n, okay? So, we want to truncate the boundary here at sample n. But the truncation must allow the um, plane waves to travel, plane waves, because in one dimension you have plane waves, travel from left to right. Okay, because for example, imagine that you we have a uh, uh, here we have a source, that, an antenna that produces some wave. So we want that in the truncation, the waves travel from left to right. So we can write, uh, we can, we must allow this kind of waves, waves traveling towards the positive x-axis. And the differential equation that is valid for this kind of waves is this differential equation. The derivative of the wave is equal to minus jk, the, the wave uh, function. This can be field, potential, or whatever. So we discretize this, and the discretization is the derivative, is the last sample minus the previous sample, so sample n minus sample n minus 1 over the sampling step h is equal to minus jk, the value of the function. But the value of the function where? The value of the function at the center point between the two samples that you are subtracting. This is the central difference scheme that gives you the value of the derivative at the center point between the two samples. So the center point between sample n and sample n minus 1 is sample n minus 1 half. So you get the value of the derivative here. And the value of the derivative here is equal to minus jk, the value of the function here. Okay? So minus jk, the value of the function at x, n minus one half. But since you don't have a sample, <coughs> a sample there, you can approximate the value of the function at n minus uh, one half by averaging the values at n and n minus 1. So what you get at the right at the right hand side of your discrete equation is this, and the left hand side of your discrete equation is this. And the only thing is that you have to uh, implement this in the in the in the linear system matrix. So the linear system matrix you have if you multiply everything by h and by 2 in the linear system matrix, clearly, you have 2 uh, fxn plus jkh fxn, for, uh, and then here you have uh, minus 2 fxn minus 1, and then plus jkh uh, fn minus 1. And these are the 
So the coefficients in your linear system matrix become 2 uh, plus jk for xn and, and the next element is 2 minus jk for uh, f n minus uh, x for f at x x n minus 1 okay so these are the two coefficients of the matrix that you sorry the h is missing the h here okay these are the two coefficients of the matrix that you get you can derive them easily from from the equation so uh, you can apply this uh, differential uh, equation the the one that we used in the previous slide by the way it's called the Moore's absorbing boundary condition of first order they are called absorbing boundary conditions because they uh, are valid for outgoing waves so the idea is that they don't produce a reflection in the boundary like what you have would like what you would have is the you set uh, to zeros the the last the last sample okay so the idea is that they can absorb waves that is allow the propagation of waves through the boundary. The problem is that, that this first order uh, uh, differential equation or Moore's ab Moore absorbing boundary condition of first order is valid for waves that propagate uh, to the um, right in the x -in direction. So if we have a two-dimensional problem, they are valid to waves like that, waves that in with incidence normal to the right boundary the right truncation boundary is this so waves that propagate perpendicularly to this to this uh, boundary parallel to the x direction to the positive in the direction of positive x will be completely absorbed by by this uh, boundary condition and it will be uh, very good because there will be no reflection however in practice our object may be large and remember that we have uh, equivalent sources at the boundary of the object and these equivalent sources produce waves that propagate in all directions so in practice for a point at the boundary for a point at the boundary you will have incident wave coming in different directions not only not only in the direction perpendicular to the boundary so this first order boundary condition will be inaccurate for waves that do not that that has incidence that is not perpendicular to the boundary so it will be accurate only for normal incidence like this but inaccurate for the other for the blue ones to improve the results we can set the boundary very far away from the object and then since the equivalent sources are within the, the object if at the boundary if it is homogeneous or everything in between if it is inhomogeneous since the sources are uh, inside the object the, di the possible directions of incidence are closer to the normal incident this is normal and this is the possible uh, directions of incidence that are almost normal so in this case the error is small the error due to the fact that the uh, plane wave incidence on the boundary is not perpendicular is much smaller than in this case where the directions of incidence are far away from the perpendicular direction this is what people used to do uh, with this uh, first order boundary condition so the problem is that now we have to mesh a large volume of air around the object in order to have the truncation boundary condition or the absorbing boundary condition in this case very far away from the object we can improve this using a higher order boundary condition for example it is often there were often used second order or third order absorbing boundary conditions that are valid for n plane wave directions of incidence if it is second order two directions third order for example third order a third order boundary condition would be okay 
for a normal incidence, and imagine for example 45 degree incidence on one side and 45 degree incidence on the other side. So in this case, you can have the object closer to the boundary, but anyway, you can have the object closer to the boundary because you now you allow you allow a wider range you allow a wider range of incidence directions but anyway you have to mesh a lot of space around the object you have to mesh a lot of space around the object not as much not as much as in this case not as much as here with the first order boundary condition but still you need uh, quite a, uh, quite a, a important amount of space mesh around the object and this increases a lot a lot the number of unknowns because, rem because remember that you are in three dimensions you are in three dimensions so if in three dimensions your object is like this and, and has dimension D and you mesh a space of size 2D, what happens is that in three dimensions you uh, have to multiply by 2 the number of samples in X, by 2 the number of samples in Y, and again by 2 by the number of sam samples in Z direction. So the total number of samples increases in the third power of 2 equal to a factor of 8. And this is a lot. This is a lot. You, you multiply the number of samples by 8 is a lot in case that you need the double size. So the idea is that uh, this kind of assuming boundary conditions increase a lot the number of, of unknowns and um, we need something better. They have been used for many years, for many years until and, and for that reason, the methods based on finite difference and finite elements were not as uh, uh, used as, as often as today, because today we have a much better truncation boundary condition that, that is the, the perfectly matched layer. Well, and this is the modern boundary condition that is implemented in now in commercial uh, software. Uh, here it's implemented in differential uh, in difference in differential equation commercial software, either finite differences or finite elements method. And the idea is to put a medium that is match and lossy around the object. It's the medium in blue color here. This medium is lossy, so uh, when the waves uh, scattered by the object inc are incident in this medium, they, be they become attenuated. They become attenuated inside the medium. They are then the medium is terminated with a uh, with a perfect electric conductor. So in fact, the termination of the mesh is the perfect electric conductor. And the waves are the very attenuated waves are reflected at the perfect electric conductor and are reflected again, so that and the, at the end, after passing two times through the lossy medium, once in for, first in forward direction and second ref, after reflection in backward right direction, they are completely attenuated and they are not reflected back to the object. So this medium is lossy and completely absorb the power of the waves. But it is also matched. It's matched because we don't want we don't want our wave to be reflected at the uh, interface between air and the and the medium. So it is both matched and lossy. And it is uh, it is important it is, it is difficult to develop uh, the formulation, the properties to develop to the epsilon and mu of a very special medium having these properties. In fact, it is a non-physical medium with tensor magnetic uh, conductivity. So you define epsilon and mu for this medium 
that they are not only complex, but they are also tensors and anisotropic. But anyway, it's, uh, it's very way. The, the formulation and the implementation is complex and is difficult, but it works very, very, very well. In fact, it works very well because it ab completely absorbs the waves, so it is much more accurate than Moore's or other absorbing boundary condition that had some reflection for for uh, di most uh, directions of incidence. This absolutely has almost absolutely no reflection. It's very very good, very accurate, and also uh, can be used very uh, very close to the object. In fact, it is enough with about uh, two or three largest between the object and the truncation. So the air around the the air between the object and the truncation and the perfectly matched layer is about only two or three layers. So it's a very thin. You only very you only need a very thin uh, coat of air around the object, and then the perfectly matched layer is again very thin. It is only three to five layers. So at the end between five and eight layers around the object, you can completely truncate the, the mesh and with very good accuracy. The only thing it, it is that the com formulation is complex and difficult and the implementation also. So you will find, of course, it in commercial software, but if you have to write your own and very simple software to analyze a very simple case, probably what you want is to implement uh, maybe a third, second or third order absorbing boundary condition like this. This is first order, but there are equivalent ones that are second or third order. And it will not be very accurate. It will need a lot of unknowns, but it will be very, very easy to implement. The perfectly matched layer is, uh, uh, let's say, advanced. It needs a difficult formulation, difficult to understand. You have to read uh, very difficult to understand papers and also the programming is complex and difficult. And to finish this video about finding different methods, just a last slide about the sparse matrices. We have seen that the matrix, the, that the linear system matrix in finite difference contains only a few elements different than zero and uh, all the remaining ones are zero, so it is almost a uh, field of zeros and there are only a few elements different than zero. So we will spe use a special methods to store the matrix and to solve the linear system. Of course, we only need to store the non-zero elements. So uh, the idea is that we store the elements and we store the location of the elements, but there are there is optimized way to save memory that is better than storing the real value, the, the complex value of the element and the integer row index and the integer uh, column index. This is two real numbers for the complex number plus two integers for the location. We can do this in, there are special ways to store the location in less than two integers. Anyway, the, all this is uh, implemented in some libraries that are available in the software. And the idea is that if you use MATLAB, and MATLAB has all the operations with the sparse matrices already implemented. And if you use low level languages like C or C++ or Fortran, etc., you have lots of libraries that operate on, on sparse matrices. And the idea is that only they only store and operate on the non-zero elements, so you save a lot of storage uh, and a lot of, of computation time. Also, of course, in Python language, you have uh, mod modules for, for operating with, with sparse matrices. And to solve the linear system, remembering that the solution of the linear system, you, we have to multiply the matrix of the linear system times our estimation of the unknown to obtain the next estimation of the unknown. Okay, remember, and this 
uh, matrix vector multiplications are in fact multiplications of the row of the matrix of the rows of the matrix times the vector but the rows of the matrix contains many zeros so we only have to multiply the elements that are different than zero so at the end the number of operations that we have to 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 do is proportional or equal to the number of non-zeros n n set means uh, a number of non-zeros okay number of non-zeros and the number of non-zeros is proportional to the number of rows because the non-zero elements per row are, is, is determined by the uh, differential equation for example here let's say in 2D in two dimensions every element is related only to the four neighbors so here we have only f five non-zero elements per row each row relates one element of the unknown which its four neighbors so only five elements five non-zero elements per row in in three dimensions there would be also one element at the uh, above and one element below below so there so there will be there would be seven non-zero elements per row so the important thing is that the number of non-zero elements per row is proportional to the number of unknowns and the computation time is proportional to the number of operations that is proportional or the same as the number of non-zero elements so the time to compute the matrix vector product is proportional to the number of unknowns so the overall uh, to the overall solution time is proportional to the number of iterations times the number of operations per, per, per iteration the number of iterations is of the order normally a square root of n that is n power 0 0.5 so this becomes of order n 1.5 which is uh, much better than what we have for a, for a full system of equations for a full system of equations we have the number of iterations times n, n square if we don't use any fast solver or n log n if we use one of the best fast solvers the important thing also here is that the n is large here n is large because we have a three dimension and uh, with a full matrices if we use an integral equation with surface discretization n is a small because we have a, a, two -di a, two -di a two dimensional mesh on a surface okay so uh, this is the idea for the finite difference and finite element methods the overall solution time is of order n to power 1.5 but however n is very large for uh, integral equation methods depending if we use fast solver or not we have uh, let's say uh, without fast solver n to power 2.5 because the number of iterations is n to 0 0.5 and with fast solver we have n 1.5 uh, log n okay but with much smaller n so at the end the most efficient methods overall are integral equations with surface discretization and a very efficient fast solver like multilevel fast develop like multilevel multilevel fast multipole algorithm lmfma so normally the fastest is i.e. with uh, surface discretization uh, fast solver like multilevel matrix decomposition uh, sorry multilevel uh, sorry uh, not multilevel uh, fast multipole algorithm and this becomes of an overall order taking into account the 
and all the iterations are over all n 1.5 log n and can be even less if you use the combined field integral equation with a very good preconditioner we can have a number of iterations that increases very very slowly with n so that it can even be uh, let's remove that 1.5 and remember and leave one point something small just slightly more than n if you have a combined field integral equation with a very good preconditioner and this is why with these methods you can solve very very large problems uh, with million thousands of millions of unknowns that are even too large to uh, find a difference methods that need n to 1.5 number of operations overall which is quite good but uh, still large for very large problems because you need a three-dimensional mesh and in three dimensions the number of unknowns is much more than with a surface mesh of two dimensions.